this uh, workshop. Usually we cover this topic in chapter 10 of our astronomy course, but sometimes because of the lack of time, uh, we always miss, miss the chapter 10. So this should be an occasion for the student to know the topic of galaxies. So uh, I thank my colleagues, uh, Professor Mashour, uh, Dr. Antonius, uh, Mohamed Rehan, uh, for participating in this uh, nice workshop. And hopefully every one of us is going to benefit uh, from it. So there are four, uh, there are uh, five lectures, uh, one about galaxy formation, the other one classification of galaxies, uh, one Milky Way galaxy, uh, we need to talk about it, it is on home, uh, the Milky Way wavelength observation of galaxies and the extra galactic zoo. And I believe in these five topics, uh, we hope to cover as much as we can uh, about uh, galaxies. Well, the main thing about galaxies uh, is how do they form? Uh, how do they come about? So we have, uh, uh, as you know, we believe that we have more than about two, two trillions, two thousand billions of galaxies. So we need to know how can we form such a, uh, such a big islands. Some of them are big and some of them are small, some of them are average. And they come in different, uh, different shapes, uh, different morphologies, and so on. And I believe my colleagues are going to talk to talk uh, about it. So to cover uh, galaxy formation, so top down or bottom up, uh, I would like to go through this uh, outline. First of all, uh, we have a universe full of mysteries, uh, scientific mysteries. I would like to make sense of these mysteries by using science. Uh, then again, something very important, discovery of quasars, uh, supermassive black holes, uh, our own Milky Way, uh, supermassive black hole, other supermassive black holes, galaxy formation, top-down model, uh, bottom-up model, and also these quantum fluctuations in density that are very, very, very important uh, whenever we talk about uh, uh, forming, forming anything, forming big, uh, big structures uh, like super clusters, clusters, or even making uh, making a uh, solar system like our own solar system that's why we need to we need to look into this fluctuation in density that are very very important to start forming anything well uh, there is a supermassive black hole as we believe today now at the center of almost every galaxy in the universe you may ask how did they get there how can you form such a supermassive black hole uh, what is uh, the relation between these supermassive, these uh, monsters, black holes, and the galaxies that surround them? Are they always in, uh, in, at the center? So, so, so every time, every time we look uh, further out using uh, our tools, our uh, very sophisticated uh, ground observatories or space telescope, we discover new and new mysteries. So, uh, so we need to have an understanding of all these mysteries as we move on. And this, this here, it will bring me to this discovery, discovery of quasars. It was one of the most fascinating discoveries. Uh, why? Because uh, it gave us a look at something which is very, 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 very powerful. Uh, we need to understand uh, uh, these quasars, what are they, and also how uh, they can be. Uh, we, we start to observe them, especially in the radio, in the radio, uh, and using radio telescopes, uh, we saw that they were very, very bright. And uh, even, uh, even though they are very, very far away, so th th they may be hundreds of millions or maybe billions of light years away. Uh, so uh, in the 60s, when we started to discover them, so we found uh, them first in the radio, in the radio domain, then we turned our optical telescope to observe them. Uh, I believe the first, uh, the first person to, uh, to name them quasi, uh, quasar are this uh, Chinese young young Chu. Uh, what does it stand for? Quasar, quasi stellar objects. When you look at them, when you look at them, they appear like if they were stars. Look at the one to the left. So it, it, it is like a star with all the spikes, but this is much powerful than the entire galaxy. So it cannot be a star. And if you take the spectrum of these objects, as I'm going to talk about it uh, in my last lecture, it's the spectrum of this object is non-thermal, uh, so uh, uh, it is it is it is not uh, 
because you have stars burning uh, some chemical elements to have that very nice thermal spectrum. No, it's very different. So it must be something else. It must be related to some very exotic uh, uh, physical processes like, uh, like synchrotron radiation, like uh, huge magnetic fields, like relativistic particles. All of these are very important in order to understand this beautiful, uh, this beautiful uh, object. This is just uh, an example of this uh, supermassive black hole. This is uh, just a simulation of what we call the M87, this uh, uh, very, very known uh, galaxy in the Virgo cluster. So it is the one that uh, uh, two years ago, so we were able to, uh, to get uh, a look at its uh, supermassive black holes. So supermassive black holes, so these quasars, uh, they appear like stars, uh, like a, a single point source, but they are not stars because they, they do emit more energy than the entire galaxy. Uh, so over the years, using uh, several systems, several telescopes, uh, uh, we, we tend to, to understand uh, what, are these, uh, what are these quasars. They are actually black holes, but not, not regular black holes because we know that if it's, uh, if you take a star, especially for the very massive ones, at the end of their lifetimes, they become black holes. But these are not stellar black holes. So why? Because the mass of these supermassive black holes uh, is around millions or even billions the time of the mass of the sun. So we need to understand how can you form such a very, very supermassive black hole um, from, uh, from nothing. So we need to understand. So this is just, uh, what you see here uh, on, uh, as a picture this again M87, and you can see you can see here it's beautiful uh, it's beautiful optical jet because some of these uh, uh, supermassive black holes they do emit uh, jets uh, in opposite directions, and sometimes we see only one jet. And as I said in my last lecture, I will try to to explain uh, this uh, this 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 jet morphology in this. Uh, what you call the uh, extragalactic radio sources. So we believe now that uh, these supermassive black holes exist at the heart of many other galaxies, even, even, even home, even our own Milky Way galaxy. Yes, it has, uh, it has a supermassive black hole. So in the 70s, in the mid 70s, Astromo discovered a radio source at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. It was titled Sagittarius A star. Uh, and in this source uh, would match uh, the emission of very supermassive black holes. And, and to be sure that we are looking at the right, at the right object, because when you look to what the center of the Milky Way is full of dust, so the best way to look into it is to use longer wavelength, like uh, infrared radiation. And this is exactly what astronomers did. And what you see here in front of you is a very nice simulation of the stars, but near, 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 near this, uh, uh, this X in the middle. So what are these X? It's just uh, just how these uh, galaxies, how these stars are going to move around. So, and you can only explain the motion of all the stars around this center, the center of our Milky Way. You can only explain it if you have uh, such a big, such a big gravitational force. And that big gravitational force is just the result of a supermassive black hole with the mass, uh, a couple of millions of the mass of the sun. And there are also other supermassive black holes. So, uh, so surveys, uh, of galaxies, especially let's say the Andromeda galaxy, uh, the, our closest uh, spiral galaxy, about 2.4 million light years from us, it has also a monster in its center. Then we need to ask questions. How did they form? And where did they come from? But well, you can explain a stellar black hole, a couple of mass uh, times the mass of the sun, uh, especially if that black hole does not uh, rotate. So usually we ask ourselves that if a black hole does not rotate, uh, its, its size its size of a black hole is just equal to just uh, three times its mass. So three times its mass. And the mass must be given uh, in solar mass. For example, if I have a black hole, the mass equal to one solar mass, its size will be just three kilometers. But this only for those black holes that do not, uh, that do not rotate, okay? So we can explain the formation of these black holes, but how about those supermassive black holes with mass millions and also, and also billions? So we need to uh, solve this mystery. How can we form? And this will bring us to our subject. This will bring us to galaxy formation. So 
using our tools, especially uh, more and we, now we're getting more and more sensitive observatories uh, using our uh, physical theories with upon good physics. Uh, now uh, astronomers are gathering the evidence uh, in order to get to the bottom of this mystery. How can we? Uh, how can we form such a supermassive black holes? And also, how can we form a galaxy in the first place? Which comes first? Is it a supermassive black holes, or is it, uh, is it, is it, is it uh, what, we, what, what we call uh, uh, this uh, uh, galaxy? So um, currently, there are two models. Uh, and I won't go into the details, but let me present the idea behind these two models. We have a top-down model meaning that we start from something being, and that something being will give us something small, 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 until we are, we are left to stars. Or we have the bottom, the bottom up, meaning that we go from something small, stars, we build up until we get something, uh, something quite big. So which one is right? Let us start with the top-down model. So in this case, you have, a, you have what you call a galactic supercluster. Uh, millions of light years, maybe more than that. Uh, starting to contact under its own weight, and as and it is for primarily about hydrogen that was left after the, uh, the Big Bang. So here, you what you have, you have a supercluster worth of stars. So as the the supercluster came and there uh, came to contact under its own weight, so you have the formation of these stars, and this what you get. Uh, uh, this supermassive will get to form as the dense cores of these galaxies. Uh, so. Uh, uh, it's like it's like what it's like uh, like what uh, when we teach about how can we form uh, our solar system. So we have this solar nebulae. So we have a, a cloud uh, falling under its own weight because of gravity, and as it does contract, to become hotter, hotter inside. And uh, once it reaches a certain temperature inside, so that has the inside is going to ignite, and we see a star is born. So this is uh, so, and all that time. Uh, these stars are going to mature and uh, from some of them are going to form black holes. So in this case, so you start from something big, a huge, huge supercluster worth of stars. And this is what you have here in, also in the simulation. So you have these huge, huge supercluster, superclusters and as they form under their own weight, they form stars. And you have this kind of uh, uh, structure that you see here as here, as you can see, forming uh, some kind of uh, spiral galaxy. The bottom up, the other model, is uh, is different. Uh, so what we have here, we have small pockets of gas uh, collecting together into larger and larger masses. Uh, it does resemble uh, a solar system formation and uh, supermassive black holes. And so they're going to form uh, dwarf galaxies and even the clusters and superclusters we see too. When I say a cluster, a cluster of galaxies, like if I talk about the local group, uh, we have about 53, 54 galaxies forming what we call our own local group. And these clusters are going to get together with all the clusters to form what you call the super, uh, super clusters. Uh, so, so we believe that in this case, the supermassive black holes uh, were drawn from collisions and mergers between black holes over billions and billions and billions. So you have small black holes getting together with other black holes and you have this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of uh, simulation uh, showing us uh, how we can form such a, uh, such a, such a big uh, such a big big supermassive black holes. As I said, this part, this bottom up model it, it looks like uh, uh, what we have in our solar system. How did we form? So bottom up, small parts coming, uh, small parts coming together. So we can show you some simulation about how this uh, how this uh, supermassive can block. So now. So we have the top down and we have the bottom up. So we have to try to explain in a more general way how we can form this, uh, uh, this uh, big structure. So which one is right now? I think that over the decades, uh, we have uh, some kind of idea. So, and this will bring me to a quantum fluctuation. Shortly after the Big Bang, uh, the entire universe was so, 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 but it was not uniform. The density was not everywhere the same. There was some kind of tiny quantum fluctuation in density at the beginning. And this quantum fluctuation evolved to become bigger and bigger and bigger to form what we see today as galaxies and galaxies superclusters. So this small microscopic variation were very important in the early universe. 
And this vari variation, as I'm seeing, over millions and also billions of years, give us what we see, what we see today. So how can you, how can you, how can you uh, bring all of this idea, uh, this idea, this uh, this quantum fluctuation? How can you check it? How can you observe it? Well, uh, at the beginning of this fluctuation, there was some kind of fight, fight among two forces. But well, the universe was expanding. So on one hand, the universe is expanding. On the other hand, you have what you have this, what you call the, this mutual gravity of particles putting one against another one. So you have two forces, one that does repulse and one that does attract. And it is all about these two forces. Which one is bigger than the other one? So the size of the galaxies, as the observations show, the size of the galaxies, clusters and superclusters, were decided by the balance between these two forces, these two opposing forces. If small pieces came together, then you will get what you will get, what you call the bottom up of formation. So you get small fluctuation. Okay, so you can be able to form stars, and stars will get together to form big uh, system like, like a galaxy. And if large pieces uh, came together, like that supercluster, then you get what the top-down formation. So you either have here a bottom-up formation if small pieces get together, or you have this uh, top-down if uh, large pieces come together. What does that mean? Are both models right? Well, I say that we prefer the bottom-up right? because uh, when you do your simulation and when you involve gravity, so uh, when you look at uh, some very, very large scale, when you see those uh, clusters, super clusters, you look, this is uh, huge. This is, this is what you call the top one model. Uh, that observation are proving to us that the, few, the first few stars uh, just from a few hundred millions of years after the Big Bang. And if this stars just formed a few hundred millions after the Big Bang. What does it mean? It means that uh, it will support the bottom up. So the answer is both and the, uh, and, uh, uh, the answer is no at the same time. So most modern observations, especially after uh, the, uh, the LIGO experiments where we were able to listen to these neutron stars colliding. Uh, so gravity, as we know, moves with the speed of light. Uh, which means that uh, this interaction that exists between the particles spread away from each other and then to catch up with the speed of light. And because of that, because of this uh, gravity uh, speed of light, so you won't be able to get supercluster worth of matter to come together only if a star worth of material. So that's why here uh, what we, have, we are observing are these small fluctuations are the one that started uh, the process of star forming. And the first stars, as we know, because of the big need that there were only hydrogen and helium. So, were, so these stars were pure of hydrogen and helium, and some of them were very, very large, with a mass maybe bigger than 150 solar mass. We don't see them a lot today because they live very, very short lifetimes. So these very first stars were able to grow into a more massive star that we have today. And they were, and after dying, they were exploding. They were able to form uh, massive black holes. And these massive black holes were able to get together to collect into super and super and super massive black holes. So over millions of years, so these black holes were able to do what? Were able to accumulate and to have the mass, billions of the mass of the sun. And this is what we have today inside, inside galaxies. So the bottom up uh, does uh, follow our uh, observation. This is another simulation about uh, how can we uh, uh, form this supermassive black hole through these particular uh, galaxy uh, collisions. So here you have two galaxies coming together uh, through simulation here. And uh, what that also will be what we observe today. This is a very, very nice example of two galaxies Colliding, giving a specific, uh, specific object. So we have uh, hundreds of these interacting galaxies that we that we observe today. So now, uh, how about observing these supermassive black holes? So how can we support this uh, uh, 
uh, this merger of galaxies to be able to, see, uh, to, to support this supermassive black hole formation. Well, there were a uh, recent observation of two very special uh, small, small uh, galaxies, tiny galaxies. We call them uh, dwarf galaxies. But these dwarf galaxies are very, very, very special. This is, uh, you can see here in the image, uh, this is M87. So M87 has, uh, has a companion, a very small uh, compact uh, dwarf. Uh, but the black holes of this compact dwarf, this one or this one is quite special because if I compare the mass of these black holes in this compact uh, dwarfs to that of our own Milky Way galaxy, which we believe is about uh, 4.1 million times the mass of the sun, this 4.1 million time, times the mass of the sun only represents 0.01% of the uh, Milky Way total mass. But these dwarf galaxies, the black holes is quite different. It is 4.4 million in one of them, it is 5.8 million, and this is 13 to 18% of the mass of the house. So how can we explain this uh, huge supermassive black holes compared to our own Milky Way black hole? So the, key, uh, the thinking is that these galaxies were once normal, but they collided, as you can see in this very nice simulation to the lower, uh, to the lower right. And over years, okay, this, uh, supermassive black holes were able to form through the collision of this uh, uh, of this uh, of this uh, tiny of these tiny uh, galaxies. So the bottom up is what we believe today. Uh, so uh, through what we believe through our observations, through, through our simulations. Uh, so the uh, the first stars were able to form these proto galaxies uh, and this. First star were dying as uh, black holes, and these black holes get together to form these supermassive black holes. Uh, so, uh, so what we see today as our universe is just the end result of uh, millions and billions of years of formation and also of destruction. That's why every time we have new tools, we have a new telescope like the coming uh, James Webb Space Telescope, we're going to get at the bottom of uh, so many, so many. Uh, mystery, mystery that we think we did that we have so but there are still some open questions about uh, uh, about uh, this formation. You can see in this very nice simulation the first fluctuation formation of the system, uh, formation of, uh, of of galaxies, galaxy collisions, superclusters, and everything. So all of these questions. Hopefully, the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, this uh, infrared uh, space telescope that we replace the. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope will be able to give us to give us some questions about uh, uh, this uh, galaxy formation, this bottom-up uh, model in which things start from the small parts to become to become a big, uh, big part. I believe this is my last slide. So uh, I thank you for following uh, my lecture. So please, if you have any questions, or if you would like to leave it at the end, so it depends up to you. Okay, so this is it. Okay, so any questions, please? I I kept my time under 25 minutes, that's excellent. Okay, I see a question here. How do you determine uh, the age of the galaxy? Uh, it is very, very, very difficult. We used to say that the Milky Way galaxy is about 100,000 light years, and Professor Moshe is going to talk about it, but now it is more than that. So there are, uh, there are no limits uh, to, the size, uh, to the size of, the, uh, of, the, of any galaxy. So it, it, it all depends upon how, the, uh, how, how that, uh, uh, that uh, light profile should uh, light profile is going to fall. So uh, you just gave an average number for the size of any galaxy. Is it really that we can print it the sky apex? What do you mean by the sky apex?
don't tell me that uh, this universe has has a center. If universe has a center, it must have a, it must have some kind of uh, borders. Usually, whenever we talk about a border, we talk the visible the visible edge of universe. So there's it's not like we are on Earth. Earth is just one planet going around the sun, uh, star, the sun, the sun just one star going around the center of the Milky Way uh, at about 26,000 light years. Our galaxy is just one galaxy among 2,000 billions of galaxies. So there is no privileged uh, location. Everything uh, moves, or universe is expanding, wherever you are, especially on the large scale, everything is moving away from you. It's like if uh, is like if, uh, if everything goes. Okay, how do we measure masses of black holes? Well, uh, if I take as an example, M87, uh, so uh, because of that huge supermassive black holes, anything around is going to spiral. And as gas are going to move around, they get heated. So they will become hotter and hotter. So we can more, and as they become hotter, they will emit uh, more and more X-rays. So we can follow the speed of these hot gases. Once you have the speed, you have the mass. If you use Kepler third law, and you, you can have the mass. So once you know how much time does it take this object to go around, okay, you know the distance, you can find the mass. This is just a, a very simple application uh, of Kepler third law. So it is quite simple. If that black hole, let's say, for example, is a, is a part of binary star system, the same process will happen. So Kepler third law will be able, once you know, because Kepler third law is just how much time does it take to go, as a function of the distance, once you have the uh, uh, once you have the uh, the time, it, how much time does it go to go around uh, that binary star system? You know the distance between the two stars, the black hole, and whatever star you have as a companion, uh, you have the mass of that object. And this is exactly what you do to figure out the mass of uh, uh, of the moon. So the moon goes around us. We know how far away we are. We know the time, and you can just again apply Kepler theory to find the mass of that. Uh, uh, of that object. Okay, so let me uh, let me uh, uh, so let me uh, stop my sharing here. Okay, uh, so please we have uh, we now we go to the second uh, to the second uh, lecture by uh, Muhammad Rehan. Muhammad Rehan, so you can share you can share your screen. Okay. Uh, so and you can start the lecture. Good morning, everyone. Let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. That's great. Um, okay, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Mohamed Rihan. I'm a research assistant in the uh, radio astronomy uh, lab. Uh, today, we will talk about the classification of the uh, galaxies. So our uh, lecture, this lecture will be a, a brief description for uh, all kinds or all uh, shapes of the uh, galaxies. Um, we, we will start from uh, here. Uh, beyond the Milky Way, there is a vast space uh, inhabited by galaxies. We know the, that our universe inhabited by, by the galaxies and the distances between the, these galaxies are very, very enormous. So, uh, the closest one, uh, it, it is our, our neighbor, uh, is, uh, we know it is an Andromeda galaxy, M31. Uh, but the farthest uh, galaxies lie billion of light years away. Uh, the universe galaxies exist in enormous diversity. So we can see a lot of shapes. It comes with a lot of shapes, sizes, masses, uh, colors, and um, existence of the um, black hole and the, the X-ray emission and everything. So a very, very uh, large diversity uh, in, the, in the galaxies. Uh, some of these galaxies uh, looks like uh, wheels. Uh, it, it, is, it is a very common uh, kind of uh, galaxies. Uh, and uh, some of them uh, contains um, uh, millions, few millions of uh, stars and some of them, the, the, the biggest galaxies uh, that uh, uh, were discovered uh, contains around a trillion star. So uh, this is give us uh, an idea about the, the uh, diversity in the galaxies. Um, the early uh, scientists 
uh, worked with the galactic or the galactic classification was the very famous uh, American astronomer. He's American, but he was um, he was um, a British style uh, astronomer, uh, Edwin uh, Hubble. So uh, Edwin Hubble, he has a, has a large contribution in the galaxies in general. So he he discovered the uh, or or uh, he evaluate the. Uh, constant of the uh, universal expansion, the Hubble, Hubble constant. So he has a, a very, very uh, a large, cont uh, important contribution in the uh, galaxies. So uh, influenced by the, um, by the uh, evolution, uh, he tried to find a timeline or, 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 or time scale for the, uh, for, for the uh, evolution of uh, galaxies uh, so he uh, suggested that uh, the galaxies uh, started as, as a, a spherical uh, a shape uh, or globular uh, shape. Uh, and uh, then uh, when it's uh, evolved, uh, it, it will be, uh, uh, it will be uh, elliptical a little bit and uh, more uh, eccentric and more and more. And then it will end as uh, spirals or the spiral galaxies. So this is a, a this is a, a evolution uh, galactic model, but it is not true. Uh, so that's why uh, they, they, there are uh, a lot of uh, scenarios of uh, evolution, uh, the galactic evolution. But this model or this this model uh, gives uh, gave the astronomers uh, ability to uh, classify the galaxies. So this is a classification model. It is not, again, it is not a uh, evolution, uh, evolution uh, model or process. Uh, the, the evolution process, it is very, uh, very complicated as, as uh, Professor Elias uh, described uh, uh, for us. Uh, it is very uh, compl uh, complicated and there are a lot of uh, theories, but this is, this is a good model to, to uh, uh, able to, to, to make us uh, able to understand how to classify galaxies. When you look to any galaxy throughout the, your telescope or uh, uh, on the internet, uh, so you can imagine that, uh, that model or that uh, scheme and you can classify this galaxy and fitting uh, it in its, uh, in its correct uh, position. So um, the, the, this, uh, this, this is called, by the way, this is called the tuning fork, um, a tuning fork uh, uh, diagram, uh, Hubble diagram. Uh, uh, why? Because it looks like a tuning fork, you know, the tuning fork, the, the, this is the, the fork, the, 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 the musician uh, used use it to, to tune their uh, musical instrument. So this started from E0, E0 means uh, it is not elliptical. It is a uh, very close to a globe, very close to spherical uh, shape. Uh, then uh, E two, E three, uh, and, and and so on. Uh, and this uh, this line uh, ends with uh, with this one. It's called a lenticular uh, uh, class. It is a it is a, a meso. Um, uh, state between the, the elliptical and the spiral. So it is not a spiral and it is not elliptical. It is uh, uh, among these uh, uh, two classes. So uh, let us describe this, uh, this, uh, this uh, type of, uh, or uh, this is a classification uh, model. Uh, so uh, as we said, uh, in, the, in, the, in the most basic level, uh, we will divide the all galaxies uh, uh, as uh, its uh, shape into these types. Uh, e means elliptical, uh, SO means lenticular, and SA uh, means S comes from uh, spiral. Okay, uh, A that means it is it is a very close to the lenticular, very short arms. Uh, SB uh, very uh, or larger for larger arms and. Uh, SC for uh, a very uh, well uh, spiral shaped uh, galaxy, uh, and so uh, uh, and uh, the same thing for for SB B uh, B B capital here it comes from bar. So some galaxies, some spirals, sorry, 
show uh, a, a little bit uh, eccentricity in its bulge, in its nucleus. So this uh, eccentricity, it looks like a bar or stick. So that's, that's why we, we call it SB, SBA, SB, uh, B, SBC, and so on. Let's start with the, with the spirals, uh, because uh, as we said, it is, uh, it is uh, not uh, necessary to start from elliptical because it is not a starting point. It is only for classification purposes. Um, so let's begin with the spirals because they are uh, the, the most common uh, uh, galaxies and it is, a, it is a logo for any galaxy. Even for, for SAS logo, it, it, our, our, our academy has the same uh, beautiful spiral uh, shape. Uh, so uh, around uh, 25 to 30% of galaxies in the uh, universe uh, are spirals, including, including uh, our own. In each one, we can notice that the, the flattened disk uh, of gas and dust and uh, nebulae, uh, all of these materials rotating around the galactic in nucleus, so, or bulge. Uh, uh, the old, we can notice that uh, when we look to the, to the, to the uh, spirals, especially to the spirals, uh, we can notice that the yellow and red stars uh, uh, gathering uh, near to the to the uh, nucleus, or forming the nucleus, uh, while the uh, the blue stars, the uh, uh, new uh, uh, the the new uh, or the youngest uh, uh, blue and white stars, forming the arms of the spiral. And when you look to the to the spiral, uh, you can see or you can notice that the, the 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 distance or the space between the 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 arms are empty. It is not empty. It is full of stars and nebulae and uh, gas and uh, and dust and everything uh, forming a new generation, uh, new stellar generation. Uh, so let's see the let's take a. Um, um, a very short look to the uh, spiral uh, structure. So, um, the, as we said, the space between the, the arms, it is not empty. So, the, 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 the spiral itself, it is a full disk, okay? Uh, and the, the spaces between the, the, uh, the arms are filled with, with material, but it is not bright enough to, to show from here. From, from Earth, but by using uh, a different spectrum, by using uh, 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 like a IR or, or, or uh, UV, you can see uh, more and more uh, materials, and you can see the fingerprint of the, the all kind of uh, radiation uh, between the, the, the arms. So it is not a, a, an empty uh, space. Uh, spirals also, it rotates slowly around its it's, it's center, the, the, the nucleus or the, uh, the core or the bulge. Uh, so uh, this rotation, because it is not a rigid body, it is not a solid disk. Uh, so uh, we can, we can uh, uh, notice that the, the nearest uh, stars or nearest components rotating around the nucleus uh, faster than the, or complete uh, an orbit, around the nucleus faster than the, the farthest components, like the farthest stars. Uh, uh, that make this, uh, this kind of uh, galaxies, so it happens for all, uh, for all uh, celestial system, but for the galaxies, they are something special, make the, uh, the, this kind of galaxies has its um, uh, distinguished uh, or unique spiral uh, shape. So uh, I will I will describe this in in, in short uh, briefly here. Okay, I will not go for for uh, details. Uh, so um, by applying the um, Keplerian uh, law, uh, uh, first law, the, the the orbital motion. So you we can imagine that we have a, a perfect uh, galaxy. So this diagram uh, show. Uh, a, a perfect, it is imaginary galaxy. Um, uh, when we have a, let, let assume the stars here, we have a stars, uh, I'm trying to find, yes. Uh, yes, 
uh, this this uh, the the closest uh, orbit to the center it has a uh, it is an uh, elliptical uh, shape okay or or uh, yes it's elliptical shape the speed of, of or rate of re rotation here it is faster than the uh, the farthest as we as we said but uh, Notice that we can see a very uh, a neatly, uh, neatly uh, aligned uh, elliptical orbits here in this, in, in the perfect galaxy, in the imaginary galaxy. So this kind of galaxy is not exist, okay? So uh, the speed here is, is uh, the uh, speed of rotation here is faster than, than the, the outer edge. For the spirals in, in the real uh, spirals, we, uh, we will not uh, see this uh, this uh, this alignment. So there is a variety or shifting in alignment for each orbit or for in, in each distance. So that that's why when when, when this when this when this uh, variety of alignment coupled with the slower movement uh, farther from the nucleus that create a spiral arms gradually. <clears throat> So uh, this is called uh, this is called a density uh, wave in the in the in the in the spiral. So this is uh, uh, what happened uh, for the spirals when the when the galaxy uh, acts or sorry reacts with the the tidal gravitational uh, force from the other uh, galaxies. So uh, this is uh, all about these uh, spirals. But let us see this uh, simulation. That's this simulation uh, described what I uh, said uh, before. So let's see this simulation. This is an imaginary um, disk, imaginary uh, galaxy. It does not uh, exist, okay? Um, and this is its, its components. It, uh, it is a uniformly distributed uh, uh, in the whole disk. Uh, so uh, let's see what happened when uh, this uh, Imaginary galaxy. Mr. Marwan, can you mute your micro? Okay. So let's see. So notice that the stars around the uh, around the nucleus are faster than the, the farther uh, part. It takes this uh, uh, elliptical shape and uh, gradually the arms uh, formed uh, by, uh, by this effect. This is a called a uh, wave, um, wave density. And this is forming the elliptic. Uh, sorry, that this is forming the um, uh, the uh, spiral shape of these uh, kind of uh, galaxies. So this is the what we find. So uh, for for many for many uh, density waves, uh, many uh, or uh, double density wave or or uh, multiple density wave can uh, generate uh, more and more uh, arms. Uh, let's see. The, oh, sorry. Yes, uh, let's see some examples of the spirals. Uh, let's start from, uh, from the first uh, class of the uh, spirals, SA, uh, the, the ordinary uh, spirals without bar. So uh, here we can see uh, um, uh, an example for, for this kind of spirals. It, it is very, very uh, hard to detect where is the spiral arm and how many uh, spirals uh, here by 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 using uh, the the visible light, but in other uh, spectrum you can figure out this uh, the, the, the spirals uh, or the uh, uh, spiral structure uh, obviously. Uh, so this is NGC uh, seven thousand uh, or seventy two seventeen. It is a SA um, type, so it is a, the closest class to the as we said, if you remember the lenticular uh, shape. Here uh, on the on the right, uh, we can see a grand design um, 
Galaxy. It is a uh, NGC uh, 5194, and it is um, uh, it has a, a SC uh, class. Uh, that means it has a, a well uh, spiral uh, structure. Uh, let's see the the other the other uh, part on the uh, uh, part of the of, of, of Hubble uh, uh, diagram. The spiral the bar spiral. Uh, galaxies. Uh, so uh, here you can see this kind. Uh, this this is a, a bar of the galaxy, and uh, its arms are uh, barely uh, be absorbed. Uh, so it, it, uh, there is no uh, uh, obvious and clear uh, arms for this uh, for this uh, galaxy. But we can uh, easily we can uh, uh, figure out the the bar the central bar. Uh, Extended from its uh, its uh, nucleus. Uh, this is a, a NGC six hundred sixty. It it is a SBA and uh, an example for SBC, a very very uh, good spiral shape galaxy, but barred uh, galaxy. Uh, it is um uh, NGC one hundred uh, one thousand three hundred uh, SBC. Uh, by the way, uh, our own galaxy. It is a it is a barred barred. Uh, Spiral uh, galaxy. Uh, let's go for the the simplest uh, shape of the galaxy, the simplest uh, style or class of the galaxy. Uh, galaxies. Uh, it is an elliptical uh, galaxy, so it shows little structure other than the simple uh, ball shape, where each star orbits the galaxy's dense core. Uh, the uh, chances to uh, collision are very uh, remote, so uh, because. Uh, this, this, the component of this galaxy is uh, take an or, uh, taking an orbit in all directions. So you can see, uh, uh, in, in, in the let's say in the x axis or the horizontal plane, uh, there are uh, rotational uh, components or rotating components, uh, and the uh, uh, tilted orbits also existed uh, perpendicular. So you can find an orbital motion in all directions. Uh, but this elliptical uh, galaxies, it is not elliptical because we 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 face it or or we look at at, at its face or from the top. There is no top and down in the, in the universe. But uh, it, it is not face us to to be absorbed like this. If you look at this galaxy from any direction, for from all directions, you can find uh, it's, it's called an ellipsoid. Uh, it is it is a three dimensional elliptical shape so it is not a flat one so uh, because we, we observe the, the universe in two that two dimensions uh, we can we can imagine that it is it is a flat but it is not a flat it is a, a ellipsoid or spherical uh, shape with uh, with a degree of eccentricity um, so uh, with no uh, gas and dust uh, uh, clouds interact with, uh, there is no feature. It, uh, this kind of, of, of galaxies, uh, it is a kind of featureless uh, galaxy. So you cannot uh, figure out any kind of uh, clouds, uh, gas and dust uh, clusters, uh, and so on. It looks like a, only a nucleus, a, a very large nucleus, uh, uh, galactic nucleus, and, and that's all. Um, so uh, almost this kind of galaxy uh, contains um, uh, yellow and uh, red uh, stars, uh, like the the core, the 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 the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, majority of the of the of the spiral core. So uh, and there is uh, no uh, formation of uh, gas formation and dust, uh, as we as we said. So uh, it is a, a the, to distinguish between an elliptical uh, galaxy, between uh, all types of, of gal uh, elliptical galaxy, we can we have only one factor. It is a its eccentricity. So that's why uh, Hubble, when he, when he when he classified this uh, the, the elliptical galaxies, uh, starting from E zero, E one, E two, and, and so on. So let's say let's see uh, a couple of uh, examples of uh, this uh, the, of the uh, elliptical uh, ellipticals. Um, it is this one, NGC 4552. 
it is a E0. E0, that means it is very, very close to, um, to, to the ideal sphere, okay? Uh, and it has a very, very little eccentricity. So look at this galaxy. Uh, this galaxy is stretched, it's, it's, this is, uh, it's, uh, it's a nucleus and stretch uh, to, 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 to this region. So this galaxy is a very common example for uh, the uh, E0 uh, ellipticals. Uh, another one, let's go for E6, uh, NGC, it is an example. Uh, EGC, it is uh, 205. It is E6 uh, class. Uh, I think this, uh, this galaxy, it is among the, uh, the uh, Virgo uh, galactic uh, cluster. So it is also the, the uh, example for, for the featureless elliptical galaxies. Look at that, it looks like a, uh, the, the nucleus. By the way, when we when we uh, when we look to 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 the spirals through a small telescope, we can only detect by our eyes. We can only detect the nucleus. So it looks like that. When you look to to Andromeda galaxy, you will uh, through small telescope, you will see the same uh, shape. It looks like this, uh, but. Uh, when you use a, a advanced uh, photography uh, 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 photography uh, uh, instruments and, and uh, uh, method, you can uh, detect its arms. But for elliptical, you cannot see anything else. Uh, this this elliptical uh, shape. So let's go to to the to the. Uh, connecting uh, class between the spirals and the elliptical. It is the, uh, the lenticular uh, galaxies. Uh, at first glance, the lenticular galaxies appears to be uh, relatives of elliptical. It is a elliptical, but um, at the contrary of ellipticals, when you look to the elliptical from any direction, you will find the same shape. But for lenticular, no. For lenticular galaxies, if you look at this galaxy uh, face to face or from the top, if you if you want, um, you will find it as a elliptical, like this, like like this galaxy. But when you look to the to to, to its side, you will discover it has a distinguished disk. So it is not ha it, it, uh, uh, it doesn't have the the uh, the same shape in all directions. So it is a uh, it, it looks like a disc or the uh, looks like a, uh, a burger sandwich. Okay, uh, so uh, dominate this this kind of of galaxies dominate by the uh, spherical uh, nucleus and the most thing that uh, that helps you to to dis uh, to to distinguish between uh, this uh, lenticular galaxies and um, uh, elliptical galaxies is the existing of the dust and gas, okay? So we can see uh, very lines and very circles of uh, gas, uh, dust and gas um, uh, uh, rotating around the, the, the uh, it's a nucleus. Um, uh, okay, uh, so here is, a, here is a common example. We have two examples for the uh, lenticulars. So lenticulars, all the lenticulars had the same uh, same designation, SO. So there is no lenticular one, two, three. All of them are lenticular. So they are, uh, uh, it looks like uh, spirals or, or ellipticals, sorry, ellipticals, but with the dust and gas formation and clusters around the nucleus. So this is the, the, the one, one of these examples. Uh, NGC 7255, and the other example, it is very, very, very uh, clear. It can uh, get, uh, shows the, the idea at the, at the first glance here. Uh, it is a, it looks like a, a hazy shape, hazy disc, like a lens uh, with, the, uh, with the clouds of dust and gas. And the last kind or the last class of the, of the galaxies irregular galaxies, IRR. So uh, not all galaxies uh, fit into the uh, scheme of spirals, ellipticals, or lenticulars. Uh, some of these uh, uh, misfit the uh, galaxies are. So uh, the galaxies uh, are colliding with the components uh, or being bolted out 
of shape by the neighbor uh, by the neighbor uh, galactic uh, gravity. So uh, the the galactic tiding effect and gravitational forces can destroy the structure, the whole structure of the galaxy, and make it uh, a regular uh, galaxy. So this kind of galaxies is out of our uh, classification uh, diagram, the, the, the tuning fork diagram. So IRR, you cannot fit in, in any uh, category. Uh, a very, very common example for uh, the regular galaxies are our, our uh, galactic satellites. Uh, uh, the small uh, Magellanic uh, cloud and large Magellanic cloud in the southern uh, sky. Um, so, uh, a common example for irregular, uh, regulars, uh, IC3583 uh, and uh, NGC3034. Uh, NGC3034, it is the same galaxy, it's called an M82 in uh, New York Major. It, it is one of, the, uh, uh, one of the brightest galaxies in the, in the uh, night sky. So thank you. I finished. Uh, if you have a question, uh, please, you can ask me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raihan. Thank you. Any questions, please? I see here a chat when you mentioned that uh, the orbit closer to the core being, uh, being what? Let me, I lost my message. Uh, being closer, uh, okay, being faster than the outer layers, wasn't that proven to be wrong since dark matter means the outer layers, do you mean that the outside are moving faster than expected by sit lower than the outer? Well, this is, this is, uh, one, this one observation that uh, we can take uh, to prove that dark matter exists because uh, if we follow Kepler third law, as you move away from the center of mass, the speed of anything uh, must decrease, but we don't see that. If we take as an example of our Milky Way galaxy, as you move outwards, so the speed of these stars is going to increase, meaning there's something there that does push, that does uh, create uh, some kind of gravity and it is responsible for that. And uh, uh, this notion, yes, we take it as, uh, as a proof that dark matter exists, yes. Any more questions for Raihan, please? Uh, please, I am seeing on the chat that some people are advertising for their own website, uh, so please do not do so. If I see you, I will just uh, kick you out. Okay? Thank you very much for respecting uh, our, our workshop. Any questions, please? Okay, let me check. Does any star object exist without being inside the galaxy? I am talking about stars and planets. Yes. Yes, we have discovered some, yes, uh, some single yes, stars. Doctor, please, the, please the, I can, yes. You can check the chat and you can see the questions, Rayhan. Okay. Let me see. Based on what galaxy form center plane does this form a surface? Which which question? Uh, yes, this uh, one. Does any stellar object exist without being inside the galaxy? I'm talking about star. Uh, yes, uh, no, uh, for sure. The uh, uh, there is no uh, there is no stellar uh, objects like uh, stars, uh, uh, nebulae, anything in the intergalactic uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 the. Among the space or in the space uh, between the galaxies, so all the uh, cosmic matter, all 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 the the the, the atoms, uh, the uh, the energy uh, uh, are fed inside the galaxies. So the space between galaxies, it is um, uh, mostly it is it is empty. It is it is the emptiness itself. There are some ex there are some very very weird exceptions where we have discovered some single stars. And these have been ejected uh, either through uh, galaxy coll uh, collusions or maybe ej ejected by, uh, uh, by the supermassive black hole. So we have some very, very rare cases of single stars by themselves outside anything, just in the, in the, just in the interstellar medium or in the, uh, just in the uh, intergalactic medium between galaxies. But these are very, very rare objects. Any more questions?
please uh, for the uh, for the uh, for the certificate uh, 10 minutes before the end of this workshop we're going to advertise for the link where you can write your name your id and we send you the certificate by email but not now in the last 10 minutes as it has been announced by isam as you can see it now on the chat in the last 10 minutes we're going, we're going to have uh, there's a question, uh, have uh, humans ever recorded the end of a galaxy? Can you answer that, Rehan, or do you want to answer? Yes. Uh, the question again, I, I missed the, the chat uh, panel. Okay, there's, uh, have humans ever recorded the end of a galaxy? You mean the end of a star or of a galaxy? Oh, okay. No, uh, yes, for, for, for galaxies, no, not, not, not yet. For the galaxies, there is no evidence. Uh, uh, I think Dr. Uh, Professor Elias, he, he has a, a, a largest uh, uh, information uh, uh, background. But, uh, but uh, uh, as, as I know, there is no evidence to the end of, of any uh, nearby galaxy in our, uh, in our supercluster, uh, galactic uh, cluster. So I think, uh, uh, no. Because it lasts for for uh, uh, billions of years, uh, the galaxies it, it is it, it, it contains uh, stars. Uh, these stars, uh, some of them uh, 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 near to the to the universe uh, age. So, yes, yes, professor, if you, if you yeah. want to add something. Yeah, as you said, you take billions and billions and billions and billions or zillions zillions of years for so. Uh, uh, if if uh, to for this to happen, if if it is for a star, have you have we recorded a star dying? Yes, yes. In 1987, I remember uh, some astronomers in the southern hemisphere observing and a star, and a star in a large margin cloud exploded in front of our eyes. Yes, we see star exploding. We it happened live in 1987, and we have about 100 of these supernova explosion uh, uh, discovered every. Uh, every every uh, every year. Usually, we say that we have one of these star dying uh, uh, in a galaxy every uh, in a typical galaxy every century. Okay, so let us stop here for this lecture. So thank you very much, Rehan. Now we go to our third lecture. I would like to invite Professor Mashur to share his screen with us and to uh, present uh, Milky Way or our own Milky Way galaxy. Please, Professor Mashur. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My talk will be about Milky Way. Um, of course, it's not exactly my field, but uh, I usually say, even if the 7 billion people uh, on the earth uh, work in this field, wouldn't be enough to understand the space, to understand everything. The, the raised questions in the last two lectures, actually, we can say these are open, still open questions. Um, when you ask about the age of the galaxy, or even our galaxy, do we know it or not? We, as, as Professor uh, Elias said, we do not exactly know. Is it 100,000 light years or more or, some, or less? Um, uh, when I was uh, in the master, uh, uh, when I was studying master, uh, we studied that uh, the number of stars in the galaxy, in our galaxy, is about 100 billion stars. Now we know that it's around 200 billion stars. It's doubled in within 20 years or so. So I'm going to talk about the structure of the Milky Way and it, its components, uh, dynamics and mass of the galaxy, dark matter, uh, stellar populations, radio maps of the galaxy, the galactic center. And if I have time, I will talk about the spiral arms and how it formed. Um, 
This is a sea, an Arabic sea. Sati, sati, majar, turtib, hajar. Yani, عندما تتوسط المجرة كبد السماء. وهذه الصورة. هذه الصورة للمجرة أخذت قبل أيام من وادي رم في الأردن من قبل السار عبد الهادي في 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 أمي. الآن عندما بداية الليل نجد أن المجرة تشرق من الشرق وهذا أيضا كرة نارية هنا بنفس الوقت وبعد تقريبا شهر ونصف ستكون في منتصف الليل في وسط كبد السماء أي تتوسط السماء فعندما تتوسط السماء تبدأ الرطب بالنضوج هجر هي مملكة 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 معروفة قديما في شرق شمال المملكة العربية السعودية وتضم البحرين أيضا فهذه من الأقوال المعروفة في هذه الصورة نرى الذراع الرئيس المجرة ونرى مركز المجرة هنا في اليسار الأعلى هذا هو سجيتاريس اللي هو القوس برج القوس وإلى اليمين في أقصى يمين على يمين هنا برج العقرب وهذا النجم الأحمر هو قلب العقرب أنتارس وهو عملاق أحمر ونجد الشولة وتحت هناك اللسعة وهذا إذن هنا على اليمين وعلى اليسار برجين الأبراج معروفة أبراج الصيف برج العقرب والقوس ورمى عقرب من قوس لجدي نضح الدلو بركة الحيتان هكذا تصنيف أو تسلسل الأبراج Now here we have the, the, the center of our galaxy as we now know and we have here we have here Scorpio. Um, what about uh, why do we study the Milky Way? It's actually our home. It can be studied in a unique detail. We are living inside it. Uh, it is a highly typical galaxy. Understanding the Milky Way, key for understanding the whole universe, provides prop for constitution of the universe. Much progress in the last decade. I can say a lot of information. 95% of the information we know about the universe and about the galaxy done in the last 100 years, from the starting from the work of uh, Hubble. Um, still many unresolved questions. We remain on the frontier of physics and astronomy for the foreseeable future. Uh, too many, as I said, too many, still too many open questions. What about the dimensions of our galaxy? As we know up to date, we don't know tomorrow what we are going to discover. So up to date, we know that the radius stellar of the stellar disk is around 12 kiloparsecs, which is 37,000 light years from, here, from the edge to the edge, from here to here. Distance, sun, to center is around eight kiloparsecs from the sun to the center of the galaxy to the uh, known um, supermassive black hole, which is around 24,000 light years. Half mass radius is around about 40 kiloparsecs. Thickness of the stellar disk, disk thickness of the stellar disk is around uh, 1,200 light years, not that thick. Stellar mass of the galaxy around 50, 10 to the power nine, which we can see 50 billion uh, solar masses. And the gas mass is around 5 billion solar masses. So we can say together 55, but what about 20 billion? You said they were that, you said 20 billion. Oh yeah, because the, 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 the average mass uh, of, the, of the stars is less than the sun. So the sun is a little bit above the average of the of the uh, stellar masses. So uh, almost everything we see in the night sky belongs to, to the Milky Way, except Andromeda, if you, uh, your eyes uh, are good. So we have here, uh, as we said in the background, this is, this is a part of the Milky Way. In winter, you can see also that these arms, the arms of the galaxy uh, near Orion. Uh, now in summer we sit in between or near, near between uh, Scorpion and uh, Capricorns, exactly uh, through uh, Sagittarius. Uh, we see most of the Milky Way 
as a faint band of light across the sky. Uh, this faint or the, 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 the dark uh, parts are due to the, to the gas and, and the dust in the galaxy. Um, from the outside, if we are lucky to see the Milky Way, Milky Way we will see it like this, it might look like this one, uh, which is, this one is Andromeda, the nearby galaxy. The structure of the Milky Way, as we said, we have here the sun, and this, this is the disk, uh, nuclear bulge, and uh, we have the bar here, you can see the bar, so it's, it's uh, SB, the classification of this galaxy is SB, and we have the halo uh, around uh, the disk, or holding the disk, and exactly, we don't know what is the exact the diameter of the halo um, now. It's just a predictions about, I said, uh, we can see uh, between 75 up to 100,000 light years. Uh, we have global uh, globular clusters, which are uh, uh, clusters of stars, thousands of stars. These small dots are uh, clusters. So um, this is the galactic plane, galactic center. And uh, the structure is hard to determine because we are inside. Distance measurements are difficult. Also, uh, our view towards the, um, <laughs> uh, to, to the galaxy is obscured with, by the gas and the dust. Uh, so we don't see what's behind the gas. Uh, this is the, by the way, let's go back. This is the gas here in this, this picture, you can see it, and the dust. So, uh, first attempt to unveil the structure of our galaxy made by William Herschel in 1785, based on uh, optical observations. Um, the shape of the Milky Way was believed to resemble a, a green stone, like the, 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 the green milk which with the sun close to the center. Uh, strategies to explore the structure of our Milky Way. Select bright object that you can see throughout the Milky Way and trace their directions and distances. So we focus on specific stars or global clusters or open clusters or even gas or dust or anything. Select any object and try to observe it for years. Observe objects at wavelengths other than the visible. Uh, so, so convince the problem of optical obscure, obscuration. Uh, as, as we said that uh, uh, this uh, gas and dust obscure what's behind it and catalog their directions and distances. This is what astronomers actually do now. Trace the orbital velocities of the objects in different directions relative to our position. Uh, two types of stars, uh, star clusters. We have the open clusters and we have the globular clusters. Or uh, 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 this is the this is one of the uh, open cluster clusters. It's Pleiades. Pleiades. This image also done by Abdel Hadi from Wadi Ram in Jordan recently, uh, last winter. Uh, and this uh, another one from another. Um, site open cluster which is uh, h and uh, chi per si uh, open clusters young clusters recently formed stars still blue as you can see and there's still some gas around it like uh, uh, chicks new chicks within the disk of the galaxy but globular clusters hold thousands of thousands of stars uh, with mm, red stars mostly uh, red and yellow as you can see uh, old uh, and uh, well uh, concentrated. Uh, so uh, we are going to use um, or scientists who are trying to study the galaxy are focusing on these clusters to uh, understand the, 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 how it moves, how the galaxy moves. So we have Sagittarius here and we have, uh, this is a Scorpius and we have these M's which are Globular clusters. إذا مثورية في السماء تعرضت يراها الحديد العيني سبعة أنجمي على كبد الجرباء وهي كأنها 
جبيرة در ركبت فوق معصم هذا القول أبو العباس ابن محمد بن يزيد المعروف بالمبرد uh, globular clusters he is one of these clusters dense uh, of around 50 to 50,000 uh, to 1 million stars old around 10 billion years uh, lower main sequence stars if you put the stars on the main sequence you will find it down there lower right approximately 200 globular clusters in our galaxy uh, which is a huge number. Distribution of globular clusters is not centered on the sun. So the sun is not the center of our galaxy. Even uh, the question which was raised about the center of the universe, no center for the universe at all. But for our galaxy, we have a center. Uh, if we look at this map, uh, this is the sun and most of the globular clusters are spread around uh, a point here which is the center of the galaxy, uh, but on a location which is heavily obscured from direct visual observation, we cannot see it directly. So we need to, to observe this, this point or this, this target using diff, uh, other um, wavelengths than the, or the visible. So we go to infrared, we go to radio, go to X-ray, go to gamma ray, and so on. This is the, the center. If you can see nothing, just dark area. This is the supermassive black hole, which we are going to talk about. It's here, by the way, it's now near the logo of Shaja on this image. Interstellar dust absorbing optical light and it's mostly infrared. So let's focus uh, uh, on infrared. This is a near infrared image. This is the Magellanic clouds in the uh, Southern hemisphere and the nuclear barge galactic plane infrared emission is not strongly absorbed and provides a clear view uh, throughout the Milky Way. Uh, okay, I have to go a bit fast. Uh, so disks are nearly a circular orbits in the disk of the galaxy, but we have other orbits not aligned uh, with this uh, disk. So we call it the halo stars uh, and the galactic center we have uh, we have uh, the rotation of the of the galaxy is a differential rotation it's not like i'll show you now an image it's not like a, a wheel okay sun orbits around galactic center with around 220 kilometers per second one orbit takes approximately 240 million years stars closer to the galactic center orbit faster there was a question about by the way to Mr. Rehan about this point. Stars further out orbit more slowly, okay? So now if we draw the observations, we find this one, these are the observations, but Kepler's third law predicts this um, relation. There's a contradiction. How can we explain it? This, is, this was one of the, of the struggles, one of the um, open questions in the, in the last century. Rotation curve, orbital velocity as a function of radius, and if all mass were concentrated in the center, the rotation curve would follow a modified version of Kepler's theory. No, but it's not the case. This is what we call wheel-like rotation, and this plant-like rotation. So this is the curve, and this is a wheel-like. It's not like this, and neither like this, nor like this, the, the galaxy. Something strange, something missing here. We have to identify what is uh, making the galaxy to rotate in this way. So uh, the total mass in the disk of the Milky Way approximately, approximately 100 billion solar masses. As I said before, uh, a slide before that was 50 plus 5. And so the range or the error is still big in this uh, field of research. Additional mass is an extended halo, total approximately 1 trillion solar masses. So most of the mass is not emitting any radiation. It is dark matter. So uh, this is the observed, and uh, um, sun's velocity is about 20, 20, 220 kilometers per second. Sun, sun's velocity should be only 160 
due to what we see in the galaxy, matter in the galaxy. So there's, there's a gap. This gap should be filled by what we call the dark matter. We can use Kepler's third law to estimate the mass of the Milky Way inside the sun's orbit. Sun's distance, you can find it easily from a few equations and you apply the uh, Kepler's third law and you will find th these results. So what is dark matter? It doesn't produce light. Does it have mass? Produce gravity, yes. Nature is unknown. Might be normal matter in a form that does not emit much light. Very small and dim star, little black holes, it could be. More likely, it is elementary part particles other than uh, normal matter. So it is still an open question. What is dark matter? Uh, so I'm not talking about dark energy, by the way. So just dark matter, which is a small portion of the whole universe. Uh, stellar populations. During 1944, Walter Paddy categorized groups of stars within the Milky Way into stellar populations. So uh, Jane Oort originally conceived this type of, of classifications in 1926 before him. Uh, Bade notes that the bluer stars were strongly associated with the spiral arms and yellow stars dominated near the central galactic bulge and uh, globular clusters. So two main divisions were defined as population one and population two stars, with another new division called population three uh, added in 1978. What is the story? What is population three? So population one, I call it in, in, in Arabic, uh, uh, so uh, we have to classify stars into two populations, population one and population two. Now we have population three. What is it? So let's have a look. Population one, young stars. Metal rich, located in spiral arms and disks. So our star, the sun, is of, of population one, uh, mostly in the disk. Uh, population two, all the stars, metal poor, located in the halo, globular clusters. What about population three? Population three, something uh, out of the scope of our galaxy. Stars are a hypothetical population of extremely massive. Luminous and hot stars with virtually no metal. So it's, it consists only of hydrogen and helium. So it's the stars of the origin of the universe, from the beginning of the universe. So don't look for uh, such stars inside the galaxy. It should be in, in the, uh, on the edge of the, of the universe. Such stars are likely to have existed in the very early universe at high red shift. The existence of uh, population three stars is inferred from physical cosmology. The abundance, what about the abundance of elements? So uh, I can easily say that all elements heavier than helium are very rare. This is the, 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 uh, this is the scale, the, the uh, linear scale, and this is a logarithmic scale. Just don't look at the logarithmic scale, look at the linear scale to understand the, this scale. This is the hydrogen, this is the helium, and here the rest of the elements. So in our sun, it's 0 0.019, the rest of the elements, except helium and hydrogen. 0 0.019, يعني, يعني 2 بالميت, maximum. Radio view of the Milky Way. Uh, so the Milky Way, we have to, to observe it in different wavelengths. This is the radio, 21 centimeter, okay? And uh, we can define some parts of the galaxy, but we have the galactic center. We have some, some uh, dark area here. It's the, the, when we direct to the uh, Sagittarius. Uh, we have also the radio emission of CO, which we can identify some molecular clouds. Uh, we have the galactic center here. And another view for the galactic center in the radio. Another view, the Sagittarius A, which 
we know that now that there's a supermassive black hole, uh, black hole here at the center. Uh, and we have, uh, just a minute, please, yeah. This supermassive black hole is around 3 million solar masses, the, the mass of this. How do we know the mass of such supermassive black hole? It's somehow easy, not quite easy, but easy. If we observe the stars around this uh, supermassive black hole, we will be able to identify their orbits and then the mass at the center, which is due to this black hole. So this X-ray, uh, this is just uh, three light here, the, the field of view, uh, Sagittarius A in the X-ray. This is the uh, Sagittarius A. This is it in the uh, radio. You can see it here, yeah. So, and this one uh, doesn't appear in this image, this in, in the infrared. So in the infrared and the visible does not appear. So we have to go to the radio or to the uh, X-ray or to, so stellar orbits around the galactic center, you can see this from 1995 up to 2004. You can see it again here, 1995 up to 2004. So we draw the orbits of these stars around some heavy object, which is Sagittarius A or the supermassive black hole, and we deduce its mass. So we have these orbits here and uh, mass is about 3 million solar masses. Fastest moving star moves at 2% of the speed of light. Yes, very fast. Emits radio and X-ray, almost certainly a black hole. We don't know exactly 100%, but we can say certainly it's a black hole. Um, what about the arms, spiral arms of the Milky Way? We have mainly four spiral arms, but we have other, other arms. We call it, uh, we have the main and the secondary. Uh, um, and we have the ball, the, 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 the bar here, and we have the center, galactic center. So the four major spiral arms are the uh, uh, Perseus arm is as shown, this is the CN1, the same color, this one, you can see it, Leo uh, Bershaus. The Carina Sagittarius arm in pink, this one, Carina, uh, Carina, yeah, Carina, where's Carina? This one, Carina, yeah, this one. And we have the sun's location, it's here, you can see it. And uh, it's in, uh, located uh, on Orion, Cygnus arm, uh, sub arm. The center of the galaxy is marked as GB as galaxy center. Here we have the main four arms and the uh, arm um, which we are inside it, it's the Orion one. And the rotation in, the, in this direction, the rotation in this direction, by the way. So another image for anatomy for the galaxy. What about tracing spiral arms? Why do we need it and how we do it? Uh, spiral arms, uh, let's just imagine we have arm C, arm B, arm A. We have a different in, in redshift. Redshift that means how uh, far it uh, moves away. So um, spiral arms can be traced from the positions of clouds of atomic hydrogen. Young stars and related objects also trace spiral arms. Emission nebula, H2 region, uh, molecular clouds, clusters of young O and B stars. What about how does these arm, arms form? We call, there's something we call density waves. Uh, imagine there's a truck which trap uh, cars behind it. So uh, look here at the image down there. There's a gap here. There's an empty place here, an empty place behind it. So uh, they accumulate in, in, in one, uh, what we call the density wave. This is how the spiral arms form. According to the density wave theory, spiral arms are created by density waves that sweep around the galaxy. The gravitational field of this spiral pattern causes stars and gas to slow down near the arm. This compresses the interstellar clouds, triggering the formation of stars because the, the cloud is denser. The entire arm pattern rotates around the Milky Way once every 500 million years. This is just another um, image showing how uh, these spiral arms uh, formulate this is the hot O and B stars, H2 regions, O, B associations. Uh, so we are focusing on these stars to understand the formation or the, 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 the 
dynamics of the galaxy and uh, how it moves. Uh, young OB stars, uh, the dust the emission nebula, the older stars, and, and so on. Uh, here are the references. Thank you very much. Thank you much, uh, Professor Mashur, for this uh, presentation. Uh, any questions have to be, uh, to be uh, uh, sent directly because we have stopped the chat because someone is sending us some uh, messages uh, for that, have, that have nothing to do with what we are doing now. That's why we have stopped the chat and we're going to open it uh, hopefully 15 minutes before the end of the workshop for those people, uh, to, for us to send them the link where they can put their names and we're going to send them this, the certificate. So please, any, uh, uh, any uh, questions, it has to be oral. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam Thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, we know that uh, the, the Milky Way galaxy is going to collide with the uh, M31, the Andromeda yes, galaxy, Andromeda. in about uh, four to five billion years. Uh, coming five years? years. Uh -huh. <laughs> Very close, really. <laughs> <laughs> so it's unlike the, the, the Chinese rocket, so it takes, takes time, no problem. Uh, so is there any evidences when we study the local group of the galaxies, the distribution of the uh, little galaxies, particularly the two Magellanic uh, Clouds, yeah. large galaxies, also, the distribution and the motions of the arms of the galaxy, our galaxy. Is there any evidence that our galaxy, that proves that uh, our galaxy is a result of a previous collision, do you think? Or, or something like this? Um, okay, first let's, let's, let's describe the collision of galaxies. If we want to understand how uh, galaxies collide with each other, just uh, imagine that you have uh, a sand in, in your hands, sand just, and throw it in, in, like this. What is the probability of uh, a particle of sand from this hand uh, collide with a particle of sand from the other hand? So the probability is very low. So the stars just go through like each other without colliding, of course, they, some of them will collide, but the, the uh, ratio will not be that high. So uh, collision of galaxies forms a huge galaxy. It could be the result of what uh, is known as supermassive black hole, as Professor Elias said in his lecture. So this could be the result, but uh, as a galaxy, which is very, as I said at the beginning of the, of the lecture, it's very uh, neat, very nice, very clean. And a model galaxy, it couldn't be a result from a, a collision of two galaxies. It is, uh, it is formed by itself from the uh, um, origin matter in the universe and uh, uh, what you said about the future of the collision with the other galaxies, of course it, it may happen, but uh, this could be uh, measured. We measure the distance to uh, Andromeda and we measure the velocity of our galaxy and the velocity of Andromeda and we can calculate, calculate it. The roughly number which you said four, four to five billion years, it's the, the lifetime of, of our sun. So before our sun die, it will be inside Andromeda, if we imagine it. I, I don't think that uh, number is uh, suitable, maybe it will take longer time to collide with Andromeda because there's a gravity from the other side, from the uh, southern uh, part, uh, which is uh, uh, the Magellan clouds. I hope that I answered the question. Thank you. Uh, let, me add, let me add one thing uh, for your yes, question, uh, Mr. Marwan. When we talked about uh, our own galaxy, so uh, we talk about what you call the galactic cannibalism, uh, which means that Gal galaxies eating each other. As long as our Milky Way is concerned, uh, we're able to discover that our own Milky Way, especially the edge, it has uh, a couple of these dwarf galaxies that our own Milky Way was able to eat some of these small irregular galaxies. Uh, so uh, 
uh, our galaxy is, is the result of cannibalism. So it is not innocent. So it was able during billions of years uh, to, uh, to, uh, to attract because of its big mass, as Professor Marshall said, it was able to attract these small dwarf galaxies and now they are part of it. So uh, why yes. uh, and how can you tell? When you look at the star, uh, the star's distribution, the type of star these dwarf galaxies uh, have, they're quite different from our own Milky Way galaxy star. So it means that it is part of uh, galactic cannibalism. So uh, each galaxy eating the, eating, eating the other one. So, um, so they do exist. So, uh, so our own galaxy is not innocent. It is part of uh, cannibalism that happened during billions and billions of years. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. Thank Marshall. you, Professor. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for this nice lecture. So we move now to another lecture. So uh, uh, Dr. Antonios is going to talk about multi-wavelength multi uh, observation of galaxies. So please, uh, Dr. Antonios, you can share your screen now. Uh, hi, can you see my screen? Yes, we do. Go ahead, please. Okay, perfect. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot share my, my camera because there is a small technical problem and I have to restart the laptop. Uh, we want to see, uh, Dr. Antonis, we don't want to see you. <laughs> okay, that's fine. I have my profile picture so you can see the profile picture instead. <laughs> that's fine. Go ahead, go ahead. So, uh, in this part, in the next uh, 25 to half an hour, uh, we're going to discuss about multi-wavelength observation of galaxies. Uh, and what it is. Uh, but uh, before we go into that, we have to understand what is light. And this is uh, a little bit of uh, my presentation that is split in two big, uh, two folds. One is about the nature of light, how we interpret the light in colors, but colors is not the only thing that we have in light. This can be extended uh, much more into what is known as the electromagnetic spectrum that is ranging from radio waves that we are listening to music or communicating with our uh, router at home uh, to do this presentation up to x-rays that we get a chest x-ray if uh, we have to. Personally, I have to in order to register to the university, uh, but that's all times. Uh, then we're going to give some examples of ground and space-based observatories, and then we're going to discuss a little bit beyond the electromagnetic spectrum. What are the messengers that we have once we are away of the electromagnetic spectrum? Uh, and then later on, we're going to see the galaxies in the universe. It is already discussed about the classifications of galaxies, evolutions of galaxies, uh, characteristic of the galaxies like what we have seen over here. I will go to discuss a little bit more about the components of our galaxies, like uh, what you need in order to have a galaxy. We're going to see an example of a nearby galaxy, uh, in particular M31. Uh, and then we're going to see this M31 and another galaxy along the electromagnetic spectrum and what information we can get out of it. And at last, we're going to have a panchromatic view of our Milky Way, uh, which is our very own galaxy, that it is, uh, it is the bright band, uh, slightly bright band that we can see in, uh, in the night sky, uh, where we are very, very far from, from the light pollution. Uh, for the record, I mean, in Greek mythology, the, uh, the, uh, the galaxy, in, in Greek we have a problem because the galaxy in the Milky Way is the same word, uh, and the word galaxy is coming from the word, the circle of milk. And according to Greek mythology, uh, the galaxy that we see is nothing more than uh, uh, the milk of era when she suddenly realized that she is breastfeeding Hercules, uh, a son of Zeus with a mortal woman and just removed it uh, because she didn't want to, uh, to breastfeed uh, a stepson. And some drops of this milk fall to the sky. And this is how the Milky Way uh, was born. 
But in order to understand the galaxies and the Milky Way, we have to understand what is life uh, and the nature of life. Most probably from high school, most of you are familiar uh, with what is light, uh, the nature of light, the duality of light, like every other particle that it behaves depending on the conditions as a particle or as a wave. Historically, they start studying the light very long ago with uh, Greek philosophers, uh, the contribution also of uh, Arab polymaths like uh, Ibn al-Haytham, that uh, he was one of the very first to study systematically the nature of light, and not only the, the nature of the light, but also the instrument that we interact with the light, like the human eye. And he was able to understand that the reflection of this light in some object can give us the impression of the vision of these objects. Before we move on, uh, for further studying uh, the light by more modern uh, physicists like, uh, uh, like Newton and Herschel that they start to understand the light using prisms and so on. Uh, but the real revolution in understanding the light, it came with, uh, first of all, the James Clerk Maxwell, who is uh, for many is uh, considered as the physicist of all physicists because he wrote four equations that they completely revolutionized what we know about the light at the time. Uh, and he actually said that uh, the light is nothing more than an electromagnetic wave, that it is an electric field and a magnetic field, that it is coupled. He wrote down his equation, he had the wave equation, and that the light is traveling in vacuum with what is known as the speed of light. Uh, and this is how we start to understand uh, to understand the light in the wave path. Uh, however, the light has a little bit of a problem, like uh, when you have the two slit uh, with the two slit experiment, you still can see it behaving more uh, as a wave. Uh, however, later on. Uh, when uh, they, start, they started to study the atoms, uh, they realized that the light is carried by a particle, and this particle, they name it photon, again from the Greek word phos, which is mean light, and photon is a particle that it brings the light. Uh, this was first introduced by Max Planck, that it said that the light is traveling in this particle and carrying a specific energy and uh, momentum as well. And Albert Einstein was able to explain theoretically what is known as the photoelectric effect that is currently extensively used in order to understand, uh, in order to explain and understand how a CCD is working, for instance. Every time that you are using your mobile phone to take a photo, Albert Einstein explained this process that because the light is behaving as a particle, it interacts with the detector on your mobile phone camera, it excites some electron, it creates some current, we record that current and we get some image. Uh, so I concentrated in three, these three figures, the last two on, uh, on uh, the left, on the right, they are representing the modern view of the light as a particle, and the one on the left, James Clerk Maxwell, represent the old view that the particle, uh, that the light was uh, uh, a wave. Uh, there were physicists, however, that they introduced the meaning of the duality, uh, that the particle can behave as a wave, as a particle, depending on the situation. As a wave, it covers a variety of an electromagnetic spectrum that we can see only a very, very tiny part of this electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, many people think that gamma rays, X-rays are not light, or most 
uh, importantly, radio waves and microwaves are not related to light. However, both of these radiations are still light. Our visible light is the light that we can see with the human eyes. Uh, we can interpret the world. We have all the colors in this, uh, in this light. We can see from the blue to almost violet, all the way uh, down to uh, red and reddish color. But what is above the UV and below the red, we don't really have the opportunity to see it because our, our eyes and the molecules that are responsible to register the colors on our retina, they don't have this particular energy gap to see other wavelengths. So we need to utilize other instruments in order to see other wavelengths. Uh, for X-ray and gamma rays, we have a variety of instruments. For UV, we are using mainly the same instrument that we are using for visible light, the CCD camera, slightly different in design, but more or less with the same principle. And in infrared, we are using Again, the same, it becomes very, very popular now, especially in any shopping mall or even at our university and our, at our SAS. As you enter, most probably you will notice that there is an infrared camera that is measuring uh, your temperature because there is a connection of the wavelength and the temperature under some certain circumstances that we are not going to be into details on to that. And of course, Beyond that, there is the microwave domain and the radio wave. So all this is nothing else than electromagnetic spectrum, or in other words, it's nothing more than light. So from the same light that we see, it's the same light, but much shorter wavelengths, as you can see on the green domain, uh, that can penetrate our uh, our skin and can make an image of our bones and then we can have an X-ray. An X uh, and it is the same with the radio waves that you can see on the blue domain uh, that uh, we can listen to our favorite uh, radio stations in the car or anywhere else. Uh, so this is the electromagnetic wave. We are lucky enough to be on the surface of the Earth, but unlucky enough because the Earth is not completely transparent to the whole electromagnetic spectrum. There are certain windows that are transparent to the electromagnetic spectrum. So, and this is good because radiation, which is above UV, energy is above UV, it's considered as ionizing radiation, most probably you have heard that in medical terms, that can create problems on the skin, can interact uh, with uh, uh, the human skin and the human cells and can create uh, cancer. Uh, so this part of the electromagnetic spectrum is blocked by the Earth's atmosphere, by the ozone layer and so on. So in order to study X-rays and gamma rays, we have to go above the Earth's atmosphere. And for this reason, we, stand, we sent space observatories in order to study what is happening in the X-rays. The same is all the way from the X-rays up to the UV uh, light. In the UV, there is a small window that ultraviolet radiation can penetrate the atmosphere of the Earth, but only the near UV can penetrate. And then we see that in the optical, we have a very clean window that can go all the way down to the surface of the Earth, that we can have our telescopes and that we can do the observations. However, you can see that we don't have only a ground-based observatory, but we have a space-based observatory, like in this image. Uh, I hope that you are all familiar with this shape. It's the Hubble Space Telescope which is a 2.4 meter telescope in orbit uh, around the Earth for the last uh, 30 years. So one will, will ask you why we sent a telescope 
to space as long as we can observe this light from the Earth. The reason is that there is no atmosphere. And then one will ask again, but you don't have to go to space because atmosphere is transparent. And then you come into an infinite loop on that, but this is not the case. In the atmosphere, the image of a star is heavily distorted by streams of air and particles that are in the atmosphere and can create, from a very sharp image, you can create a very blurry image. So this is the reason why you need to go into space uh, to study the optical as well. And this is why we have developed Hubble Space Telescope and James WST, James Webb Space Telescope that Professor Elias mentioned earlier. Although this telescope will be operational uh, in a little bit uh, longer wavelength into the infrared band. Again, you will see into the infrared band that you have a lot of mountains. You have a very distinctive pattern with many gaps. And these gaps, we call it bands or windows for the infrared. And you can see that all these bands, they don't go all the way down to the earth. Uh, they are a little bit above. So in order to see uh, reasonably well in infrared, you need to go into high altitude mountains. We do the same for optical telescope, but for completely different reason in order to avoid light pollution. For infrared, we really have to do that in order to uh, be quite high in the atmosphere, preferably in dry environments, that the light is not significantly interactive with water molecules in the atmosphere. And then we can extend all the way to far infrared and millimeter that again, we can study it more efficiently with space uh, based observatories like Herschel, uh, sorry, Herschel and Spitzer, as you can see over here. But also in the United States, there is a, a consortium of countries that they are running an airplane traveling in the stratosphere in an altitude of around 12 to 13 kilometers above the earth that they have a telescope and observe. However, there are certain limitations there and it is far better to have a space observatory. Uh, and then for the radio waves, but again, radio waves, you can see that we have a huge window uh, in order to observe the radio in, uh, from, the ground, uh, from the ground. And this is the reason that we have this wide open window in the radio frequencies that we can communicate with satellites uh, outside, like the International Space Station, like the Emirates Mars mission, and so on. Uh, an example of uh, a very advanced telescope here on the Earth is uh, the European Southern Observatory's uh, VLT. VLT stands for Very Large Telescope, which is a combination of four unique telescopes that you can see the very large domes over there. Each one of these telescopes has a mirror of around 8.2 meters in diameter, a monolithic mirror, and an armada of different instruments in optical and infrared that they can register what is happening in the skies. In addition to that, we have an armada of uh, space-based observatories that are currently being sent, currently being designed or already sent in order to study what is going on above the Earth's atmosphere for the reasons that we mentioned before. And here I will promote actually European Space Agency's fleet across the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, I will promote, I will promote these uh, seamlessly as I have been working with several of these instruments in the past and currently uh, in particular with uh, the Integral, with the International Gamma Ray Astrophysics Laboratory, which is an instrument, uh, an instrument tuned in gamma ray domain so it can observe the most energetic phenomena that are happening in the universe. Uh, currently, uh, the XMM Newton, which is a telescope in X-rays uh, that you can uh, that you can utilize X-rays to study again. Uh, the violent universe and what is happening there. Uh, these two telescopes are in the X-ray and gamma ray domain. Then we have 
the ultraviolet and optical domain with the Hubble Space Telescope that can extend all the way from infrared to ultraviolet with several instruments on board, the Gaia, uh, which is uh, a telescope to study the stars and the proper motions uh, and astrometric solutions of stars to map several uh, millions of stars. Uh, again, in optical, Euclid, another instrument that is proposed and is currently being built uh, to probe dark matter and dark energy, as Professor Masur already mentioned, uh, into the expanding universe. James WST, James Webb Space Telescope, observing the very first stars in far infrared domain. Herschel, studying submillimeter and far infrared, which is revealing the cold and dusty universe. And last but not least, the plan that it can observe the microwave radiation and the remnant of uh, the Big Bang as it is imprinted in the cosmic microwave background. We are not going to concentrate on that uh, much uh, here. Uh, and this is the electromagnetic spectrum. But the electromagnetic spectrum, it was a very important part of astronomy up to very recently. However, with the advancement of uh, modern technology and the efforts of many, many scientists, we start to realize that the light is only the 5% that we can see. 25% is dark matter and 70% is dark energy. So what we see and what we're going to see later on is only the 5% of the universe, which is not enough. So we need to study more. And for this reason, we, there are synergies between particle physicists and astrophysicists to call to, to, to develop the astroparticle domain and cosmic ray physicists with astrophysicists to develop the astroparticle domain and gravitational wave physicists with astrophysicists to study gravitational waves. So beyond the electromagnetic spectrum, in the last decade, there is a new way to study the stars, to study neutrinos coming from other stars, cosmic rays that are coming from other stars, and gravitational waves that are coming from other galaxies. So all these uh, combinations of instruments, even if we're speaking about neutrinos, cosmic rays, or ultra high energy cosmic rays, with another observatory that I don't have here, for instance, uh, Pierre Auger uh, Observatory and Gravitational Waves, open a new window, if you wish, in astronomy that we call it the multi-messenger astronomy. Remember, the title of this talk is the multi-wavelength astronomy. So we study the whole electromagnetic spectrum, but in all the cases, we are studying the light. In the multi-messenger astronomy, you depart from this electromagnetic spectrum and you don't study the light. You study particles, go, uh, gravitational waves, cosmic rays, something much, much different. And the multi-messenger astronomy, it's at the very early steps of uh, astronomy. Imagine like what was X-ray astronomy back in 60s uh, when uh, Riccardo Giacconi was first observing one star and you had only a couple of sources able to observe. But now we have thousands, hundreds of thousands and millions of thousands of sources to observe in X-rays, thanks to the development and advancements of these instruments. Uh, and this is the very first part about the nature of light. And in the remaining 10 minutes that I have, I'm going to discuss about the galaxies in the universe. Uh, a little bit fast because most of the topics uh, are already covered by Professor Masur, Professor Elias, uh, uh, Mohamed Rihan, and so on. So if we look at the galaxies that we have, we realize that these galaxies, they have bars, uh, they have spiral arms, or they are really fluffy balls of light like the elliptical galaxies. Uh, so these galaxies are categorized, as uh, Rehan said, 
in uh, the Hubble tuning fork. If they have spirals, we call it spiral galaxies. If they have uh, bars, they call viral bar spiral galaxies. And if they have, if they look like ellipses, they call elliptical galaxies. And there is an evolutionary sequence in this Hubble fork di diagram, but I'm not going to be into details. If it is nothing of that, if it doesn't have spire, spiral arms, if it doesn't have a bar, if it doesn't look like an ellipse, then we have another category for all the galaxies that we call it irregular for all the remaining galaxies. So we have elliptical galaxies, like an example over here, ISO 325, that you can see an elliptical galaxy, this is the core of the galaxy and the halo of light all around resembling an ellipse. We have a spiral galaxy with a spiral arms and an example M101. And then we have a galaxy that it looks pretty irregular, like over here in these examples, NGC 1569, most of them in optical light. Uh, another example of irregular galaxies, although it is very small to be considered as galaxies, are the, uh, are the Magellanic clouds, that is a satellite galaxy to our own galaxy. And we have two of them, the large and the small uh, Magellanic clouds. However, on the right panel, you can see something that we haven't discussed yet. And this is the interacting galaxies. As uh, Marwan asked, uh, our galaxy is in a collision course with, uh, with Andromeda galaxy and collision eventually will happen. So what is going to happen in this collision? And, and we have collisions of galaxies because galaxies are very densely populated in the universe. And we have several of these collisions that one galaxy is passing through the other galaxy. Of course, uh, the chance of two suns colliding to one another, it is pretty unlikely. However, the dynamical effects are more important. So it, once we're going to have this collision and Andromeda galaxy is going to pass through our own galaxy, the night sky will not be the same. Things will change and will change drastically. As you can see here, there are examples of galaxy collisions. You can see uh, that you have collisions of galaxies uh, happening, uh, tidal streams of material connecting these two galaxies, uh, very nice shapes of galaxies, as you can see over here, and so on. So this collision of galaxies is very, very important because this will trigger star formation and new stars will be star, uh, will be star, uh, will be start to form again. Uh, but what we need in order to have a galaxy. We need a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy to bind everything together. We need a disk that it contains gas and stars. And we need the spiral arms where the stars are forming. In elliptical disks, we have the supermassive black hole at the center, and then we have a distribution mainly of stars Gas is very, very little in elliptical galaxies uh, over there. And of course, we have something that is not visible, but again was discussed by Professor Mashur about the halo, which is not visible here, containing stars, but it's mainly dominated uh, by dark matter. So in order to form a galaxy, you need gas and stars. Not that complicated. Like making a sandwich, what you need, bread, whatever. Uh, so you need only two things. You need three things, a supermassive black hole, disk that it has the gas and the stars, and spiral arms in order to have the formation of these stars. And this is what we see if we see a galaxy in different wavelengths. Here is an example that I guess most of you are familiar with the image over here in the visible light. I guess most of you are familiar with these images uh, showing 
M31 with the satellite galaxies M33 and so on. So this is something that we are all familiar with. But when I start to see the galaxies in X-rays, it seems to be a little bit different. I don't see these spiral, nice spiral arms. I see a little bit of light at the middle that it is most probably associated with a supermassive galactic, uh, the supermassive uh, black hole at the center of the galaxy. And then I see some dots. Then if I change my view and see a little bit on the UV, on the ultraviolet, I see a similar view, but I see mainly the spiral arms. If I see in the optical invisible light in the left, in the last, uh, in, on the top panel on the very right, I see what I expect to see, stars, mainly stars, and the mid infrared again, and far infrared, the view is very, very similar with Ira, Spitzer, and Iso, that again, I can see the dust that is concentrated around, uh, around the spiral arms. And then in radio waves, I can see mostly gas uh, using the Effelsberg telescope. So if you see this, if you take this image and you try to interpret it, you see that the view is very, very different from the X-rays to radio. And let's see what are these components and what we see in different waves. Uh, here is an example of a Whirlpool galaxy. And when we're looking at the infrared, we'll mainly, you are going to see cold gas. Uh, that the radio waves will be reveal region of gas cool enough for carbon dioxide molecules in this particular band. Antonios, you have two minutes left. Huh? Yes, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to an end. Thank you. Uh, then moving on uh, forward, you are going to see in the infrared, you are going to see mainly cool stars and dust distributed along the spiral arms. In optical, you are going to see light coming from stars like our sun, more or less. And in the UV, you are going to see young, hot stars a few times to a tens of times larger than our sun. And in the X-rays, you are going to see the most violent effect, the hot, the hottest region where atoms are completely ionized. And I will come to an end uh, right now with a panchromatic view of our own galaxy, our own Milky Way, with the optical image on top that we can see stars and dark patches that are associated mainly with dust, uh, radio images or different wavelengths, uh, infrared light, X-rays, and gamma rays. And uh, at that point, I am going to stop. And uh, I hope there is still uh, room for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Antonio. So we can have uh, one question, so please, from the audience, from the students. Uh, yes, hello. Can you hear me? Please, yes, go ahead, yes. Asil. I want to ask what's the difference between a wave and a ray? Like we say gamma ray, not gamma wave. The difference between wave and? And a ray. Gamma ray and a ray. Ah, gamma ray and x rays. Uh, gamma ray and x rays, if I go no, back. No, no, I meant. Not What's the difference between calling it a wave and a ray? I'm confused uh, because we... Uh, she is saying, uh, Antonios, uh, you call gamma rays and uh, a wave. Because a this wave. is presented light. Light is a wave, is also... Light, light is, uh, yes, I mean, light is uh, gamma rays, but uh, the light is also a wave. So X-rays, gamma rays are uh, rays of light but it is also a wave. I'm not fully sure if I understand the question. Yeah, that's one, yeah. Hello, hello everyone. Yes, go ahead, please. Okay, uh, I want to ask uh, one question. Um, is there any places in the galaxy uh, doesn't contain electromagnetic field? Oh, this is uh, electromagnetic field, you mean like a light? Uh, well, 
Not really. Even, even if we forget about the light of stars, the, the whole universe is dominated by, by what, what is called the cosmic microwave background, which is uh, radiation that it is emitted, uh, which is a remnant of, uh, of uh, the Big Bang. And this is dominating the whole universe, but it's coming at wavelengths that are very, very, very low. Uh, so at very, very, very high, sorry, uh, that uh, is uh, corresponding to very, very low temperature. So in this question, no, the whole universe, there is light in the whole universe. I hope okay, I thank you very much. Question. Yeah, thank you very much, Antonios. Uh, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. I stop it's, sharing. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, let me share my screen with you. So uh, if you can unshare, sh okay. Okay, let me share my screen. Hopefully I can find my lecture here. Okay, so sorry for this. So this is uh, the last lecture. Uh, just I would like to ask uh, Isam or Fatma to open the chat so that uh, student can uh, write uh, write uh, their name to get the certificate. So let me uh, end up uh, with uh, this lecture, extra galactic zoo. So you have heard galaxy formation, galaxy classification, or all Milky Way, multi wavelength. So let me put all of this into perspective and let me talk about what you call the extra galactic zoo. So what you have outside is like a zoo of so many different uh, celestial objects. So you heard spiral, you heard irregular, you heard elliptical. Uh, so let me add more to it. Let me add what we call the active galactic nuclei. So let me talk about what you call Cepheid galaxies, radio structures of this, uh, of this AGN. Uh, FR1, FR2 classification, double load radio source, and also at the end, quasars. These very, very sophisticated uh, uh, objects. But before that, uh, I need to talk about synchrotron radiation. And this is what I said in my first lecture. So the radiation coming from this exotic object is not the radiation coming, let's say, from, from a star, which is a thermal. So what we have here in this uh, exotic object, we have extremely, extremely powerful magnetic field, and we have also particles moving around at a relativistic speed, uh, maybe more than 50% the speed of flight. Uh, so it's, this, was, this was a mystery uh, early on, but now I believe we have a good understanding of what is happening. So what is happening, we have these uh, particles spiraling around uh, this magnetic field, and whenever a particle is along the line of sight, we see this radiation. It is called the synchrotron radiation. It is very different from thermal radiation. And we can represent this radiation. But this, this is the only equation that we see on in my in my PowerPoint. So the power is just proportional to this uh, to this uh, to this uh, uh, the, to this factor of alpha, which is just uh, the spectral index uh, of uh, of my radio source. And we can plot it. So this is just a different. Uh, uh, power flux density as a function of wavelength for different radio sources, Cassiopeia, Cygnus, Virgo, and Hercules. And this is what you see as spectra. You say, okay, what, so what is so different? I just see curve. But if you compare this one, if you compare this, you know, this one to a thermal source, it is very different. And here it is. Look, if uh, the radiation coming from this object were thermal, is this exactly what uh, 
So this is exactly what uh, what you see. So let me show to present the view so I can use my pen here. Okay, so pen as you can see, so the radiation doesn't go up. It goes. Uh, this is uh, this is for the thermal thermal radiation. But for second radiation, if you take that uh, uh, neutral the power minus alpha, this what you get. You get this beautiful curve. This is uh, the signature of uh, of second radiation. So this is uh, just I'm comparing thermal. Uh, to non-thermal uh, to non-thermal spectrum in terms of uh, active galactic nuclei so what why do we call them active galactic nuclei well these are galaxies with very or extremely violent energy release in the nuclei so in this this small thing here inside does emit so much so much so much energy so that's why we call this object uh, agn and we have so many tasks we have uh, radio galaxies, uh, we have quasars, uh, we have blazars, we have so many different things. It all depends upon how we do observe them. So what does the optical part of this region lie? Well, the optical part is just here in the in this small region. This is what you call a radio map. This is a quasar 3C175, 3 for the third, C for Cambridge, number 175. This is a VLA image. Uh, VLA is just uh, that very powerful radio observatory consisting of a 27 telescope. Each one has a size of about 25 distributed along uh, uh, like a y, a y shape. So this is a six centimeter, very high resolution. So this is a radio map. So we don't see radio wavelengths. So that's why this is what you call a false color image. If our eyes were sensitive to radio wave, this is exactly what we see. We see this beautiful, uh, I say beautiful, no, it's beautiful. So this is this very bright core here. And we see some lobes here. And we see also some lobes here. But what is strange, we see this uh, very long, the very long filament that we call jet. I will talk about it as we move on. So this is just a typical, a typical AGN that lies at the heart of a galaxy. So if you observe in the optical, you just see your object here. But if you observe in the radio, it does extend hundreds and hundreds of kiloparsec. What is a kiloparsec? Just into distance, one parsec is 3.26 light years. So if I may start, so let me start with these seafield uh, galaxies, uh, unusual spiral galaxies. They have a very, you can see they're very bright core, unlike other, uh, unlike other uh, galaxies. That's why they have this special, this special name. And they, are, they have very strong emission line and they are very variable. So their variability in the radio, it can be more than 50% in a few months. What does it mean few percent in a few months? If you take the speed of light, and a few months, you have the speed of light, you have the time, you see how big these regions are. So we just apply that very simple law D equal to V multiplied by T. So you have the time, you have a, so, uh, and you have the speed of light, you can tell how big they are. So this is just one type of this AGN. So most likely uh, uh, power source, so they, they may have inside the very supermassive black hole, the mass 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8, uh, uh, solar mass. Uh, we have also intergalactic galaxies, as I talked about in my talk, and also uh, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Antonis talked about it. So these are just also uh, sometimes so we have uh, colliding galaxies and they become uh, very, very, very active. And the best example for us is Centaurus, uh, Centaurus A, which is just the end result of a spiral galaxy colliding with a little bit, and you have a beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, optical image of. Uh, of Santos. So this is another example. So you have CFID Galaxy NGC 7674, and you have here an optical image, and the one to the right, you have what you call a false color visual wavelength, just to see exactly how these galaxies are interacting. Uh, in the visible, you see nothing, just one galaxy and one galaxy here. But if you take this false color, you can see that there are some kind of uh, uh, interaction here and an interaction here and so on. So we have some tidal waves that, uh, that move in opposite directions. So this is just a typical uh, active galaxy. If you talk about EGNs, uh, when you observe them in the radio, so now from now on, I'm going to only to present the radio, radio controls, radio images taken by, uh, by radio observatories. So this is one typical uh, uh, morphology of uh, an EGN. So what you have, you have a core here, you have this is a, 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 a radio core, this is an opti this is a radio image, okay. Uh, we have these uh, blobs of whatever which we call radio lobes, 
And at the end of this radio rod, sometimes we see some bright, some bright feature right here. And this bright feature right here, we call them hot spots. This is just the end result of what? Well, you see here there's a jet here. So this is going to move freely, more or less. It all depends upon the integrated medium. And when it does collide with something, so it will be like stopped. So that's why you have the formation of this hot spot here and there. So this is just one typical one typical uh, structure of what you call the uh, radio galaxy or maybe radio loud quasars. Uh, another structure you can see here, so it is quite different from the other one. Uh, at the end of the lobe, we don't see uh, these hot spots. So it's like uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, structure is going just to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to spread away and uh, to be diffused. So we also call those these laws, but we call them plumes. And you have here in this object, you have jets on both sides. So this is one jet here, okay, and this is also another jet here. So what is or what are the general features of uh, an idea of an extragalactic radio source? When we say extragalactic, meaning it is outside of our own galaxy. So this is a typical way. So this is what you call Cygnus, a very, very powerful uh, uh, radio source, uh, very well studied. So we are, here we are labeling different components. You have A, the core, the size, milli second, very small. That's why you would like to, so, to, to, to resolve it. We need to use very, 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 very long baseline, like uh, the VLBI, like the VLBI, the very long baseline interferometer, or the very long baseline RA, where the telescope are spread by more than 5,000 kilometers. You can see a beautiful jet here. Okay, feeding one of the lobes. You can see several hot spots here. When I say a hot spot, doesn't mean it is it is it is thermal. It's just uh, a terminology. The hot spot is just uh, uh, just a region when we see the high uh, high amount of energy from it. It's not hot. It's not thermal. We are talking about cyclotron radiation. It is there is nothing related to temperature. And you can see here on the other side, you can see here that we see also a radio lobe. Okay, but we don't see clearly the other jet, which we call the counter jet. We don't see it. Is it because you don't have enough resolution or is it because of something uh, or something else? So we need to uh, we need to talk about it, not in this talk for sure. That's why we need to make some kind of classification. Uh, we ended up since 1974 with this FR1, FR2. What is FR means? It means Fanar of Riley, two scientists, two astronomers. Uh, they decided because now we have radio telescopes so we can observe uh, thousands of sources we need to, to make some kind of uh, of order in this zoo we need to classify these objects so he came up with a, a very simple classification it has been called the Fanar of Riley uh, classification and he found out that we can classify all of these extragatic radio sources into two into two types fr1 fr2 and it is mainly based upon what it is mainly based upon the morphology. There's nothing special about it. You see it, you put it FR1 or you put it FR2. But for sure, you need to make some measurement. Okay, what are these measurements? Well, there's this ratio R, which is the distance between the brightest uh, region of your source to the total extent of the source. And that's a big problem. As I was asked, how do you define uh, the limit of the Milky Way? So you don't define it uh, as having uh, boundaries. So that's why it is something that is subject to, to some errors. But in this, if the ratio for your object, uh, uh, when I say this is between the brightest region, I mean the, the, the distance between the two hotspots that you have on either side of your object. If this ratio is less than 0 0.5, you have an FR1. And if this ratio is bigger than 0 0.5, you have, FR, you have an FR2, but there are, but there are big, big morphological differences. Yes, very big. In this case, FR1, it is jet dominated. We see jets in all cases. In the other case, FR2, sometimes it's very, very difficult to see. It only depends what kind of object. Is it a quasar or is it a radio galaxy? Uh, also, you don't see very, very clear, uh, very clear uh, lobes. So uh, it is some, somehow weak. Uh, and this object, FR1, are mostly associated with large CD galaxies. This, uh, this is what you call the central dominated gas that are located in very rich clusters. Uh, so let me show some pictures so in a word. So here, here, here is two examples, FR1, FR2 for sure. Even the blind can see it. You can see two very big difference. Look at the lobes here. Here, and look at this lobe here. This is an FR2. You see a very bright, a very bright spot here. This one, 
This is my first paper in, uh, uh, in radio astronomy, my 3C47B, forget my PhD, this is my, 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 uh, my first publication in, in the radio, in the radio world. And you can see also here there is nothing and here there is something. So there's a very big difference. You can see both jets here in these sources here, FR1, and here you can see only one, one jet. And that's a problem. Well, is it because uh, one jet is more efficient than the other one, or does it have to do with something which we call orientation, how you are looking at your object? Very big question. It was the subject of my PhD thesis. Okay, so other images of FR1, so there's a zoo of everything. You can see it here. So, uh, uh, oh, by the way, all of these are, are false color images. So, this is radio emission. So, it just has been using uh, colors to be able to see the signals. So, the red one means that strong emission, the yellow one less, and the one less and less emission. Okay, uh, FR2 is look at it here, so you can see, so you can see a jet here uh, to the left of that quasar 3C334 and also 3C219. You can so we see so many different things. So we see a, a double jet, we see single jet. So we need, we need to make classification in terms of power, in terms of uh, in terms of magnitude. So we have a bunch of differences. Uh, another example. This is. Uh, the very famous M87 in the Virgo cluster, Virgo A, you can see it here at different resolutions. You have here the VLE at 20 centimeter. Okay, you can see it here. You have the VLE at 90 centimeter. You don't see the jets very, very well. As you go to high resolution, is the VLE at two centimeter, and this is the V at VH. So here you what you can see. You can see what is inside very, very near the core. And this is in the in the optical, you can see the jet. In optical M87 is one of the few sources where you can see its jet in optical in X-ray. Excellent, for sure. In radio, okay. Uh, other type of radio sources, uh, so we call them a classical double sources. Classical double because you saw in those previous pictures for these double, uh, double, double lobes. So. Uh, uh, here we see this. This is a contour map of uh, of, of radio source. You can see uh, clearly the two. Uh, the two radio lobes, okay, it is classical bubbles. Sometimes these, these lobes are not symmetrically located with respect to the core. So this is far away and this is, uh, this is closer. Is it related to orientation? Meaning that the one that we have, that we, uh, that we see here is in the back, in the backyard and this is the front yard. Uh, Why you have to observe, you have to observe hundreds and this also is what they did. So uh, another, okay, let me take, okay, let me take this Harabish, okay, well, let me leave them. This another, another, this what you call the wide angle tail, wide angle tail source. You can see that the lobes are quite open. We have the narrow, this is narrow, look at it here. This is very beautiful. This, this is uh, uh, 3C175. So it's like if this source is moving, is moving. And because it is moving, it should have been curved by the motion. So it is like moving and there's nothing. There's no ramp pressure here to be able to, 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 to stop it. But uh, this ramp pressure is bending the jet of this beautiful, uh, beautiful FR arm. And you can see also what you call the, this fat double. So you see nothing. You see uh, it's just one fat lobe or whatever. So as you can see, we have different, different types. Okay, so this double uh, lobe, double lobe radio, uh, radio source. This is again, uh, Cygnus A. You, so uh, we see jet moving on. There must be a jet here because you cannot explain the formation of this lobe if uh, if uh, the, if there is no jet here, or maybe or maybe this jet or maybe the core that you have here. It, it makes more of a flip flop. Sometimes it is ejecting from this side, and sometimes it is ejecting from this side. This is one theory that we don't like anymore. So, a uh, has port in both. And why do we see has port? Because there is, uh, there is what you call the, there is what you call energy release. So, there is, there is a loss of energy. Uh, and why do we see a jet? Because there is a loss of energy. Why do we see the star, the sun? Because there is a loss of energy. The sun is losing. So, that's why we are seeing. If it were not seeing, if we're not losing, we see. We're going to see, we're going to see nothing. So this is just, uh, as I said, it's just uh, the, vis the visible galaxy. Here it is. It is just here in this central part in the middle. Again, so many pictures, Cygnus A, and uh, uh, this is Centaurus A. I was talking about. This is just uh, the merger of two galaxies, and elliptical uh, with with a spiral. Why do you believe that? Because uh, this uh, elliptical galaxy has dust. 
But if it is, as you heard before, do not have dust. They have very, very much less dust. But this one has dust, meaning that it has been acquired through the corrosion of another. So what you see here is a beautiful radio map. Look how it does extend. Hundreds of kiloparsecs beyond the optical part of this object. Again, this is uh, uh, what we saw before. Let me move on. This is 3C75 evidence of merger because we see two. We see two. We see here. We see here two. Uh, two nuclei I mean that there's something that this galaxy is just uh, this red and result of some galaxy merger. So they do happen for sure. It takes billions and billions. This is a 3C31 and FR1 source. How do we form these lobes? That's the main question. But we believe that there is a supermassive black hole inside, and because it is so supermassive, so much gravity, uh, gas is going to spiral around, and as it does spiral around, the, uh, it is going to be, some of it is going to be uh, uh, ejected outward by this magnetic field and this magnetic field are going to, what are going to collimate this beautiful jets on either side. So jets exist on either side. So why, not, why do we see it only on one side? Well, it is because the one that we see is just directed toward us. It's like if it is Doppler boosted and the one that is not uh, that you don't see it is and Doppler boost. That's why it has faint emission. That's why we don't see it. This is the way that we understand things, meaning that uh, the difference between all of these objects that we have seen, radio galaxy FR1, radio galaxy FR2, or quasar is just the orientation. So how is it, or how this galaxy, how its radio axis is oriented toward you? And that's very, very important to know. That's why we need to do uh, hundreds and hundreds of observations in order to be able Okay, now my last slide, I believe quasars. We talked about it earlier. So they look like quasars, stellar object, but they are not thermal. Look, this is, uh, this is a star. This is how you can see it. You can see these beautiful spikes. And this is a quasar. This may be uh, inside our own Milky Way galaxy. And this may be a couple of billions of light years from us. So even though it is so, so far away, but we can still, still see it very brightly that it has such much, 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 much energy and they do and they do show very strong variability uh, on the time scale of just a few months just to tell you how big they are how big they are okay uh, when you take the spectra of quasars how do you know they're very very far away when well, you take the spectra and we see that uh, the common lines that we know the h alpha the h gamma the h uh, beta lines are not as we see them in our labs like this one here so we have a line that has been shifted, that is, has, has longer wavelength. It is, but this, this, uh, uh, this object, this object is, uh, is moving away from this. How we can tell how far we are this object through the redshift. So by observing this uh, uh, Balmain lines, we can tell half of this, the Quasar 3C uh, 273, a very, very famous one. It has also, has also an optical, an optical jet. Uh, more inside by quasars, I won't spend time. So this is just the way how we define how far away they are. The first one, 3C48, uh, so able to identify it uh, that it does emit uh, in all in all wavelength. Uh, so it is not uh, just a messy constant; it's something that is non-thermal. Uh, we can also figure out, as I say, so many, so many. Things. So why is the study of quasars so uh, so important? Only one slide to go, two slides to go. Uh, well, the study of high ratio quasars uh, does allow uh, us to investigate uh, questions of fact. The large scale structure of the universe, billions and billions and billions of light years, the early history of the universe. If we see something, let's see, at 10 billion light years, it has a, such a supermassive cause, it's not that you see it as it, uh, as, uh, as, as it was 10 billion years ago. So, what meaning that you are seeing it as it was, as our universe was young, maybe by two, maybe by three billion years? Also, galaxy evolution. So, how do these quasars tend to be so big? We talk about it in the first lecture, and also about dark matter. Yes, that it is a very, very hot topic, and uh, some of us are saying so. We only see five percent of the universe as visible light. The other ninety-five percent is either dark matter or this uh, very strange dark energy. So that's why observing these uh, quasars is very important, especially uh, we find them at gigaparsec and. Uh, as we see them, we see them as they were 10, 11, 12 billion years, meaning that we see, we see them as they were young. Uh, that's why the distance is also for this look like times. And we look at them at when the universe was only a few billion years old. 
and that's it. Thank you very much for your for your listening. Any questions, please? Any questions? I believe uh, Isam, uh, you did advertise for the link to, for the student to get uh, the certificate of attendance. Okay, so no questions. Uh, so uh, I would like to thank uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Mashhur, Dr. Antonios, uh, Mr. Mohammed Rehan for this participation, uh, for giving uh, us the time to give uh, uh, this uh, wonderful workshop on galaxies. So uh, uh, this is part of uh, the, uh, the Sharjah Academy for Astronomy, Space and Technology. So we need to, uh, we need to be, uh, to outshine, we need to be responsible, we need to uh, showcase what we are doing uh, at the center in terms of research, in terms of observation. And we need also to, uh, to, to, to be a, a good ambassador in terms of public outreach, in terms of public, uh, what you call general education, especially in astronomy. So I thank all my colleagues for their, part for their part uh, participation. Uh, I would like also to thank, uh, to thank, to thank the, uh, uh, the audience, the students, uh, our research assistant for participating in this uh, uh, in this uh, in this workshop, I'm reading here some uh, some some uh, some comments. Aina rabit al hudu lo samahtum wa takaramtum. So please, Isam or Fatima, can you uh, put the link uh, for the uh, for the uh, for the workshop? The student can register. Isam, they already sent the link twice. Thank you, Aya. Okay, I believe the link. Let me, if I can check my, uh, my, uh, don't, I don't know why I cannot check my, uh, the link has expired. Okay, this is the link for the certificate. I will ask uh, Isam to uh, put it alive again for uh, five more minutes. Please, Isam, do you hear me? Uh, Isam, can you please uh, add five minutes for, to the link so a student can register? Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Okay, so thank you for attending. So for those people who are just checking the link, so check the link, uh, put your ID and also your name. Okay. And hopefully you have benefited a lot uh, from this uh, uh, from this uh, from this workshop, it was mainly dedicated to galaxies. I believe uh, this workshop for my student is like a, a complement uh, to the chapter that we did not see. Chapter ten, it was about uh, the universe, cosmology, galaxies. I believe now you have a very good idea about uh, galaxies. So we, I may I, I may add this chapter ten to your final exam. For sure, I will get crazy comments. No, for sure I will not. I will not add uh, the, this workshop in the final exam. Don't worry. I will not add it. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you for attendance. Uh, I would like to close this workshop again by thanking my colleagues for their participation and also thanking the research assistant and also thanking all the students that participated and also uh, for the question that they did ask uh, all of us. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Shukran, shukran lakum. Shukran, shukran. Mm. Thank you, Omar Dr. Yes, thank you. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Uh, last time when I registered for the bonus, when I, when I attended the workshop, I got the, um, like, 
and email have my details, like the email and the phone number and stuff. This time when I registered, it does not give me those details. So I'm afraid it what won't be counted. What like if, no, if you did register, uh, I will find your name and find the thing. No, uh, don't worry about it. Name, the ID. I, I will send an email about all, all the all the people who attended them. Sorry, it was lagging. Were I didn't able to get. Okay, if you don't see it in you in, in the new uh, grid, email me, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you for all. So assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Isam. Thank you, Fatima, for this, and also thank you, Bakir, for the poster. Thank you very much.